the killer's interview. You sure you want to go in there alone? The warden was an uncompromisingly beefy man who drank, smoked, and just wanted to survive until retirement. He ran a tight, clean ship, and for his efforts, he was rewarded with the pleasures of guarding the vilest of abusers. His charges were lifers, and he got to babysit them until they died. But he wasn't paid to babysit the small, bespectacled poindexter with the briefcase walking next to him. Yes, the little man said, avoiding eye contact. I think he'll be less inhibited if there are no guards. Yeah, that's the last thing he is, the warden growled. He could sense the tension in his men as they descended further down the basement. Do you know his story? Yes, I've uh, studied Benedict for a long time. Do you know he almost escaped once? It took only a moment. Still not sure how he did it, but he got his claws into one of my men and... His voice trailed off as he noticed the two guards look at him. He killed him. Only took a minute. I don't know how he got to him, but, but he has a sort of way of hypnotizing people. He talks in a way that sucks you in. I guess that's how he got all those kids to come with him. The little man fidgeted nervously and said nothing. The warden studied him closely. He looked woefully out of place in a dungeon like this. He belonged in an ivory tower office writing condescending academia bullshit about the troubles of the world. They began to walk again. The guards walked slower than before and reflexively put their hands on their weapons. So, does he say much? Oh, he talks all the time. I think he thinks he's some kind of prophet. Lots of uh, biblical end of the world shit. He's here for life. No chance of parole. Can't even be around other prisoners. He's in solitary 23 hours a day and gets one hour of exercise in the yard. He stepped in front of the little man. He's got nothing to lose. The little man shuddered, but seemed determined to go on. The warden sighed, and they turned down a long, deserted hallway that was dimly lit by fading fluorescent lights. There was a closed door at the end of the hall. The guards drew their weapons. Okay, the warden said. This is how it goes down. He's secured. The door will be locked from the outside the moment you go in. No way out until you hit the signal. He handed the little man a small remote. There's one camera that we'll be monitoring. No windows. It's all padded, so no sound. As you requested. We won't be listening. No audio. The guards will be with you the whole time. Lights? This remote here. Shuts the lights on and off. Not sure why you want that. Perfect. The little man said. But I was promised he wouldn't be tied down. Cuffs are okay, but not chained to the chair. I don't know who promised you that, but he's going to stay chained. I'd advise you not to get within five feet of him. Warden, I appreciate your concern, but please, I had to call in a lot of favors to get this interview. I, I, I must have him relaxed. He has to be unchained and no guards. Are you crazy? Please, Warden, I, I know the risks. Again, favors. He handed the warden a small slip of paper. The warden read it carefully. His expression changed from pity to annoyance. I'm not taking responsibility for you if you go in alone. I understand. Please, warden. The warden sighed, pulled out a cigarette, and eyed the door nervously, then nodded his head as a signal to open. The guards checked the small view screen to ensure that Benedict was secured. One drew his weapon and the other nervously approached the door. The guards made eye contact, nodded curtly, then rushed into the room. Benedict watched them curiously. He was in his late forties, still fit despite years of solitary, and had a piercing, unblinking gaze. He offered no movement or resistance. He scanned the intruders and then fixated on the lit cigarette. The warden knew he'd salivate over it. Hello, Benedict, the warden said, standing close to the door. This is the guy who wanted to talk to you. Are you okay with that? He puffed his smoke in a small display of superiority. Benedict looked him in his eyes and wet his lips. It would be my pleasure, he said in a measured, slow, soft voice. The warden nodded. And do give my best to Susan, Cassidy, and Cody. The warden reflexively tried to stay calm, but his forehead instantly began to sweat as the murderer spoke the names of his wife and children. The professor here just wants to interview you. 
You play nice, and you get an extra hour in the yard every day next week. The first guard kept his weapon pointed firmly at Benedict's face. The guard was tremulous and looking for a reason to shoot. The second guard nervously unlocked Benedict's chains. The prisoner's eyes raised as each lock clicked open. He met the warden's gaze with an amused, questioning look. In an instant, they both knew the little man was in grave danger. The warden grabbed the little man again and whispered in his ear, This is nuts. If he charges, we'll come in firing. We'll be shooting to kill. If you get in the way, well, it won't be good. I know people who think killers are sympathetic. I know there are people who think they are the ones who can find the good in them or some shit, but there's no good in him. Only darkness. I know others who are just fanboys. Sickens me. Don't think you're special to him. Or to me. I don't care who wrote your little note. Also, don't forget that he's a killer who mutilated 13 children. One was four years old. Don't forget that. The little man nodded. The guards retreated, weapons still trained on Benedict's head. The door shut with a vacuum sealed thud. The little man sat on a chair across the small table from the cuffed killer. Benedict's eyes focused on his every mannerism. The little man put his briefcase on the table, folded his hands, and looked at the killer and smiled nervously. What can I do for you, Professor? His voice was low and soft enough that the little man felt compelled to lean in to hear. Uh, thank you for agreeing to this. I've read all your writings and media pages, and do you want my autograph? Benedict held up his cuffed hands. The little man paused, seemed to realize that he sounded foolish, and continued. No, uh, um, thanks, um, no, uh, but again, thanks for taking the time to talk to me today. Benedict raised his eyebrows. Are you a comedian? The little man giggled nervously. He fumbled with the lock on his briefcase. He opened the top and pulled out copies of Benedict's writing and multiple photographs. Benedict instantly took an inventory. Two pens, one plastic, one with some metal, and two paper clips. Do you mind if I record this? The little man said, placing his phone on the table. Benedict nodded in affirmation, keeping his eyes fixed on the pen with metal. The little man pulled out a letter opener and cut open a manila envelope. Benedict masked his surprise at the sight of the small knife. So, uh, where would you like to begin? Benedict studied the little man. He wasn't making eye contact. His movements were jerky, no rhythm, a clear sign of fear. He wasn't sure how to start the interview. Another sign of fear. He'd probably never been out of his office. This was almost too easy. Benedict considered him prey. He licked his lips. Would you like to hear about my mother? The professor laughed nervously. Well, well I think I... I think what I really want to know is why you did it. I, I, I mean, a lot of victims were, well... Children? Children. Benedict took a deep inhale. I wanted to destroy the illusion of innocence. The professor gulped. Are those pictures? Yes, the professor said, pulling out photographs of the crime scene. Benedict had called the police himself, perhaps bored of the chase. When they arrived, dead bodies were hanging on the wall of his small ranch house like obscene Christmas decorations. Benedict confessed instantly to the crimes. Unlike other mass murderers who commit suicide, Benedict relished in telling the parents of the victims every details of their children's sexual assault, torture, pleas for mercy. Benedict seemed to enjoy describing exactly how each sounded when they cried. He became excited at the prospect of seeing the pictures of the scene. I can't see. Move them closer. Oh, um, uh, okay, sure. The professor slid a batch towards the killer, still clipped in the upper corner. The little man said nothing as Benedict slowly paged through the pictures. He stared lovingly at one particularly brutal photograph of a child laying in a pool of blood and vomit. The body will often expel feces or semen at the moment of death, Benedict stated placidly. It's beautiful. Don't you think it's beautiful? Angel lust. The death of the innocent. No, I can't really look at those pictures. It gives me nightmares. Benedict smiled. This was too good to end quickly. I'm afraid I never caught your name. John. John Smith. Is that right? 
The little man shyly giggled again. Do you ever think about them? Yes, Benedict said, looking up from the photos and squarely in the little man's eyes. John Smith squirmed in his chair and broke the gaze, looking down into his lap. Benedict imperceptibly slid the large paper clip off the table into his lap. John looked back up. I think about them every night. I carry a piece of them with me. That used to be literal. Benedict smiled at the macabre joke. They comfort me at night. Small voices begging me to stop. <laughs> it's like a lullaby. Do you ever feel guilty? Why? Well, they were... They're children. For now. But then they'll grow up to be policemen or bankers or models. They'll perpetrate the lie of this world. I helped them escape before they became as evil as the rest of us. You think we're all evil? Benedict laughed. <laughs> all evil. All predators. It's just that I'm the only one honest about it. Millions of more children will die of diarrhea this year than from anything I did. Millions. Do you care about that? Sure. Really? Have you saved any of them? Well... Benedict leaned back in his chair and looked to the ceiling. Under the table, he quickly bent the paperclip into a small pick and began to work the lock of his cuff. You go about your life, secure in the knowledge that you are a good person, but a short plane trip away, children are starving, being raped, being killed, and you don't care. But if they were cute little white kids, you'd pay attention. The little man scrunched his eyebrows. I'm not sure that's fair. You don't know anything about me. I know much more than you think. Would you like me to tell you? Sure. Benedict leaned across the table and spoke softly. Your parents were professionals. Academics, probably. They were fixated on their work, and you always felt like you needed to live up to their standards. You made good grades, but an excellent saluted you. You were accepted into a state college, and got a master's degree. You tried to get into medical school, but failed. So, you got a doctorate in some psychobabble that was given more out of charity than achievement. John seemed to shrink in his chair, his face belaying shame and vulnerability. Benedict smiled and savored his dominance. You married, but you know she never loved you. You also know she's cheating on you. You're hoping this interview leads to a big splash in the papers, and finally some work that you can be proud of. Benedict's voice continued to lower. John leaned in to hear. Am I close? John looked stunned. That's incredible. His voice was soft and weak. I know everything about you, but I won't help you with your interview. John looked hurt. Why not? Because I don't trust you. You won't even tell me your real name. If you want me to trust you, you'll need to show me. John looked up, hopefully, seemingly eager to please his master. How? Benedict looked up in the camera. John turned around for an instant. Cover it. John thought for a moment. He sighed, took off his coat, and reached towards the camera. He dutifully hung his coat over the lens. While his back was turned, Benedict freed his hands, quickly snatched the letter opener, and hid it in his lap. Better? Better. Benedict smiled. I can tell that there's a question you really want to ask me. John looked shaken. Yes, he said softly. He sat down, paused, and gathered his thoughts. Yes, there is. Benedict leaned forward, pinching his face across the table. John did the same. Have you s seen it? John asked quietly. His eyes pleaded. Benedict paused. Yes. His voice was barely a whisper. John leaned closer. The darkness? John whispered. Yes. John leaned closer. Tell me about it. The darkness lies in all of us. It's in your heart right now, just waiting to bubble to the surface. John leaned closer. The world is a vampire. It feeds on the poor. 
You grow fat eating the bodies of children. I just let it show through my actions. I'm really just you. I show the world its hypocrisy because I have the strength to do so. You just sit by and let the rich grind their bones to dust. I give the world a gift. What gift? Joan whispered. Benedict paused and leaned closer. John did the same. Pain. John's eyes widened. Benedict began to see each step. His hands were free. The letter opener was poised. He would strike quickly, right in the face. Maybe he would catch his eye. He loved slicing an eye. John would recoil. He would spring on him and plunge the knife. Not, not too quickly. Into his neck. He would puncture just medial to the sternocleidomastoid muscle, plunge about two inches, feel the resistance of tough artery wall, then feel the quick give as the adventure was cut. The blood would be under significant pressure. It would shoot, hopefully, into his face and into the opposite wall. He would drink some. He would be aroused at thoughts of orgy. John inched closer. Benedict, did he tell you his name? Benedict paused. It was such an oddly specific question. Yes. John's voice lowered still. What is it? Beelzebub. John's face fell in disappointment. His shoulders shrugged as he shook his head. Benedict wasn't sure how to process this look. But it was time to spring. His pupils dilated. His heart raced. His lips smiled. At the speed of thought, he relished an orgasm of simple, brutal act of dominating another man. He would tear into his fragile throat, and for a sweet instant, the small professor would look to his better in pleading surrender. He felt the edge of the professor's throat, and he felt the foreign snap vice grip in his wrist. Down became up. He saw the ceiling, then felt his back and head smash into the unforgiving cement wall. All breath left his body, and his vision tunneled into a small corridor. For an instant, he thought he was dead. Natural instinct put every ounce of energy into finding the next breath. Benedict coughed and sat up, confused. John stood at the corner of the table, sighing deeply with his back toward the fallen killer. Benedict felt the letter opener still in his hand. He sprung from the floor with a warrior's yell and reached for his prey's nape. He again felt his feet leave the ground. He flew brutally into the wall. The acoustic pad softened the blow, but the blunt crush again expelled all of his breath. He felt a penetrating punch under his right rib and heard a sickening crack. Benedict spun around in angry fury. He reached savagely towards John, but again he lost control of his body. His face violently smashed into the table, bloodying his nose. Involuntary tears filled his eyes. Fire flooded through his right hand as he heard the sliced stick of the letter opener pierce his hand into the table below. Benedict recoiled, blinded and in searing pain, and realized he was fastened to the table. His mind pleaded to grasp the situation, but he found no answers. He moaned and choked and searched for his breath. His eyes focused on the knife sticking through his hand. The man stood next to him. He reached forward, grabbing the knife, and yanked it with enough force to lift the table for a small instant. Benedict's hand was free as he slumped back into his chair. He gasped for breath and stifled a cry. John sighed. John sighed. Calmly righted his chair from the floor, sat down, and stared at the table. Benedict instinctively squeezed his hand, trying to stem the bleeding and the pain. John rubbed his head and searched for words. He eventually looked up, met Benedict's eyes, and sighed in disappointment. Beelzebub. Beelzebub. Really? That's the best you could come up with? Why not Asmodeus? Or, or maybe Beetlejuice? Or Darth Vader? And did I hear you right? Did you really quote a line from Smashing Pumpkins? Are you serious? John shook his head and clucked his tongue. I'll be honest, I'm disappointed. Call the warden, Benedict hissed. He looked at John with abject, burning hatred. I will give you credit for getting the cuffs off so fast. That was pretty good. But the letter opener? Really? You went for that instead of the pen? I really expected more. Benedict was humiliated and hurt. He searched for a way to attack his foe. John seemed to notice. <laughs> well, here, uh, you want to try again? He tossed the letter opener towards the prisoner in a clear act of dominance. Benedict shrugged. I'm not going to talk to you. Let me out. And all that, that bullshit about pain and rich people. My goodness. I expect better exposition from some freshman seminar paper. He shook his head. 
You're really just nothing. I mean, j just nothing. Gathered the pictures and papers, stacked them neatly in the briefcase. He thought for a moment and then looked Benedict in the eyes. Benedict met his gaze, and for a brief moment, John's eyes turned completely black. Benedict was angry and hurt, but in that moment he became scared. I thought your actions were so horrific that you actually had seen the darkness. The, the real darkness, not the watered-down version we experience every night. The real darkness. He has a name, but you didn't. At least, not in a conscious way. But those kids, I mean... That was so horrific that maybe you saw it in the past or in a dream. Maybe you were just too stupid to notice. Anyways, I must apologize, but I have to check. Let me out! Benedict fancied himself the smartest man in any room. He'd been called evil, a monster, a villain, but never stupid. We've evolved away from darkness, haven't we? We hide from it, we fear it, we huddle together and pray for the dawn. Really? We've become weak. If light leaves, well, we're hopeless. You're right. John Smith is not my real name. You were wrong about everything else. My parents were terrific, and I love them dearly. I have a sister. I never did marry, and I was good at numbers, and did pretty well as an accountant. Made partner early. I had a good, if a humdrum life, but one night, I saw the darkness. I saw it just as clearly as I see you now. I thought I was dreaming, but I wasn't. It spoke to me. It It was real. It, it was real. He began to turn the briefcase, revealing a hidden snap on the side. He slid it open. He looked squeamish, and he backed away. Two thick, hairy legs poked out. John pulled out a pen, fished in the pocket quickly and pried out a hideously large spider. John backed up and shuddered. The spider sat fat and motionless on the table. Do spiders bother you? Benedict tried to conceal any hint of emotion. No. Well, they, they scare the crap out of me. <laughs> Ugh. The spider sprang off the table and scurried to the corner of the room. It squeezed into a small space and looked into the room with hideous, unblinking black eyes. That thing is a Goliath tarantula. It creeps the bejesus out of me, huh? You can imagine how terrible it is to carry that thing around. It didn't show up on the x-ray when they searched my bag. These things normally eat birds. Whole birds! John mimed a bird size with his hands. This one can smell and taste blood. Ugh. Ugh. Benedict rubbed his injured hand. Watch! John grabbed the letter opener and tossed it to the corner. The spider reached out with its front legs, drew the metal blade into its body, and Benedict imagined it licking his blood from the blade. I think that's the worst thing about darkness. Uncertainty. Just as we've evolved to pray to the light, that thing evolved to live in the darkness. When we lose our senses, we become naked and helpless. Even the worst of us feel the gnawing fear of uncertainty. John took a deep breath. I saw the real darkness. He told me his name. I heard it reverberate down to my very soul. You can't forget that. I saw him dance. Things started to happen to me. I can't explain any of it, but something distracted him and I ran. I ran for all I was worth. I ran for my life. I'll never forget that face, that voice, that name. I also know he's coming back. I know I'll see signs, I'll see heralds, others who have seen the darkness. I imagine his time gets closer. I imagine as his time gets closer, I'll see more of them. I thought maybe I'd see it in you. I thought your actions were so inhuman that maybe the darkness corrupted you. Maybe you were the herald of the end, but you didn't see him. You just did all that cruelty for masturbation. Really, you're just a pervert who finds pornography and violence. You're meaningless. John began to pace the room. The thing is, I'm not even sure I'll know what to do when I find a herald. If you're naked in a room with a spider, do you want to find it? Or do you not want to find it? You know, I can't stop him from coming. What should I do? <laughs> Call the police? Who will believe me? I don't even know what I'll do. I just, I just want to know. He approached the chagrin killer. 
I just want the uncertainty to end. I, 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 want, I want the dread to end. Joan stood, walked over to Benedict. Look at me. Hey, look at me. Go to hell. Joan smiled. He roughly grabbed Benedict's face and lifted it to his. He leaned in as if to kiss him. There's a moment of uh, naked, uh, unadulterated fear where he can see into a man's soul. It's a gift from him. He calls to me. If, if he's in you, I will see it. If you're a herald, I will see it. I need to know. I need, I need to see into your soul. And in your moment of greatest fear, maybe, maybe, just maybe, you're not just a meaningless pervert. Maybe sometime in the past you were exposed to something beautiful. Terrifying, but beautiful. Benedict spat in his face. John backed up. All of us are afraid of the dark. He hit the signal to turn off the light. Benedict was smothered with a heavy, complete darkness. I'm not afraid of the dark, he said weakly. There was no answer. Benedict sat still for what seemed to him like an eternity. He waited, waited for any sign that something would happen. I want out. Warden! Benedict screamed. Warden, I want out! Let me out! He screamed for a few minutes. He thought about trying to rush the door, but to what end? The spider was in that corner. The door was locked. He thought about feeling around for John. Maybe he could grab him and force him to open the door. Could John see in the dark? Was John still in the room? He alternately wanted him there and wanted him gone. He felt the sick dread that he was alone and exposed with a blood-eating goliath spider. He felt around the air near his body, but then he reflexively pulled his hand in from fear. But then he reflexively pulled his hand in from fear of what he might feel. A shudder seized his spine. He considered screaming again, but now felt that any sound drew unwanted attention. He sat perfectly still, listened for any movement or breath. All he heard was his own heartbeat. He wondered if he could hear his hand bleed. This won't work. I'm not afraid, he pleaded. But his voice was meek. He stood but felt dizzy and nauseous. His visual cues of balance were gone. He stumbled backwards toward the wall, hoping for some sensory feedback to orient his mind in this new, horrifying world. This won't work, he sobbed. He tried to hold perfectly still, hoping that he would hear some movement or breath. He heard nothing. Minutes passed, or was it hours? Benedict became afraid to speak or cry out. He wanted to cry. Please, please, please let me out. Please, I'll tell you anything. I'm sorry about the children. He felt a quick brush against his leg. Please. The door opened, and the little man emerged with his briefcase in hand. You were in there a long time, the warden said. Holy. I don't know what happened. Heart attack, maybe. I dropped the signal and tried to do CPR for the last hour, but, well, he just died. I'm sorry, Warden. I even think I accidentally cut his hand in the process. The guards rushed over to the body. One kept his gun fully trained on the killer's head. The other nervously checked his pulse, shook his head. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry. Really. The Warden looked puzzled at the placid look on the little man's bookish face. Did you at least get what you wanted? Tragically, no. Nothing useful. I really thought I would with this one. They both glanced at the dead body on the floor. Warden, I heard you have a interesting prisoner in cell 12. Is it Block D? Life term? And killed a family of six? Uh, yeah, he's a piece of work, all right. Do you think I could ask him a few questions? Yeah, in the same room? The warden backed away from the unnaturally calm little man. Uh, sure, um, we'll set it up for next week. Underwater microphone picks up voices. I couldn't have known they were voices when my hydrophone first recorded the sound. My best guess was a bowhead whale, 
although the pitch didn't fluctuate or go nearly as high as the typical bowhead. The sound was sonorous and powerful, a seemingly sourceless echo reverberating through the ocean's depths for at least a dozen miles around my ship. My name is Alyssa Williams, and I am a marine biologist studying the effect of global warming on hourglass dolphins and other arctic mammals. Hydrophone recordings are an essential tool in calculating the density and diversity of ocean life. Although this is the first time I've heard something like this in the past two weeks I've been at sea. We like to think these expeditions give us a pretty good idea of what's going on down there, but it's really more like scooping a bucket full of water from the ocean and concluding whales don't exist because they didn't fit in the bucket. There are plenty of unexplainable phenomenon and outlier data points and most of the time we just have to ignore them so we don't contaminate the rest of our data. It was only chance which kept me from ignoring this sound altogether. My son is an electronic music artist, which I'm pretty sure is the same as a DJ, and he asked me to send him marine recordings to sample into his music. Every week I pick out a few interesting noises to send him, lacking anything else to do with this mysterious echo, and included it in the last batch. A couple days later, I get an email back. He's been playing around with the sound, and after speeding it up, he noticed it started to sound like voices. He thought I was playing a prank on him. I thought he was the one trying to fool me. It wasn't hard to prove, though. As soon as I sped up the tapes, I began to hear it, too. It was speaking in Spanish. At least at first. He kept switching every other sentence or so, mostly to things that sounded like language. Not one I recognized. I kept pausing the tapes until I was fairly confident I had a few words right. Afrikaans, Nibeli, were beginning to pop up regularly. Then about ten minutes into the tape, and this came in English. I know you're listening. I'm listening to you too. The languages and dialects were consistent with Chile and South Africa, two of the closest countries to the north shore of Antarctica where my vessel was located. I sat in my bunk, playing with the tapes over and over editing and re-editing to make sure I had the original tracks. I kept telling myself it was a practical joke of some kind, but I couldn't figure out how the prankster could have known I was going to speed up the tapes. I should have told the rest of the crew about it, but I was terrified about looking like an idiot or having missed some obvious explanation. I decided to wait until I'd collected a bit more proof instead. I barely slept that night, mind spinning with the possibilities. Maybe it was my mind playing tricks on me, but around 2 a.m., the gentle lull of the boat seemed to change. I didn't exactly hear the sound, but I could feel it. The reverberations in the ship sinking into my bone, teasing me, beckoning me. I was getting pretty tired and angry at this point. I wasn't the only one. Turn the damn engine off! Someone yelled. What the hell, man? It's going to ruin the recordings and chase everything away. So that's what I'd felt. I forced myself to take a deep breath and close my eyes. It was never on. Go back to sleep, blockhead, my captain replied. The vibrations were only getting stronger. I sat up and stared out the porthole at the vastness of the black ocean. My mind was a carefully regulated numbness. Afraid to let any thought in for fear of where they would race from there. Then the shouting began. It was replaced with a different kind of numb, blind panic. How'd we get off course? Where the hell are we? We haven't moved. Check the GPS. But, but that wasn't there last night. What is it? I flew out of bed, already fully clothed because of the freezing temperature. A dark rolling wave passed by my porthole, completely out of sync with the rest of them. Everyone was waking up now, all clambering to go on deck to see what was going on. I went for my laptop instead going straight for the folder with the new recordings. The deep moaning call was deafening, maxing out my speakers. It was much, much closer now. My fingers were shaking as I imported the audio into the editor, and then sped up the track. My foot was tapping a river dance all by itself. I needed to see what everyone else was seeing, but I was the only one who knew to listen. More shouts meanwhile. Iceberg, 11 o'clock! That's the one we were walking on yesterday, right? Yeah, me and David. You labeled it as a dry dock type, right? It was a dry dock type yesterday. Absolutely. David went all the way down to the channel. So why is it like a pinnacle now? Shit. Look at the water line. The whole fucking thing is rising. 
Spanish from the recording. I kept scrubbing through, picking up a few isolated English words as I went. Frozen. Thawed. Hungry. Those stood out from the random scattered words. Turn the engine on now! I screamed. There was a lot of shouting above deck. I couldn't make sense of it. I bolted up the stairs just in time to see. That's not an ice pinnacle. That's... It's a fucking fin. At least 20 feet high. Sinuous webbing connecting the long bony spur which continued to rise out of the water. The captain was finally back behind the wheel. The engine roared to life. A swelling wave lifted the whole ship at least a dozen feet into the air, hurling us back down at nearly a 45 degree angle. The impetus combined with our acceleration to launch us away at a reckless pace, hurling everyone and everything that wasn't tied down. The whole iceberg we'd been stationed next to had vanished behind us. That was four hours ago, and we haven't slowed down yet. No one has spotted the fin again, but it must still be below us because the hydrophone is blasting that sonorous echo. We won't make any official announcement to the scientific community until we've had a chance to analyze the rest of the tapes, but I need someone out there to know what happened. Just in case we don't make it back. The only solution. Whenever I see him on the screen, I feel my fingers clenching. It's as if they're practicing the motion for when I squeeze the life from his small body. And it will happen soon. Finally. I've watched the boy for years, watched him grow from an infant to a toddler to the preteen he is now. He smiles easily. His heart is innocent and carefree. I'll make sure it stops beating. One of my recent breakthroughs took me beyond the viewing screen and allowed me to transport into his room as he slept. I hadn't perfected my technique to be there physically at that point, but that was coming. Just my consciousness would travel. I floated over his bed and gazed down. My hatred seethed, and for a moment, I feared he sensed my presence because his eyes flew open and he gasped. If he did detect me, I couldn't have known. He probably assumed it was just a bad dream. I watched as his eyelids grew heavy and he drifted off again. My acroporeal self smirked as I pictured those eyes never opening again. Through these encounters, I've missed my wife. The love of my life had been taken from me by the hated creature so blissfully sleeping in his bed. He had no idea what kind of monster he would become in the future. Memories of my beloved's soft touch flooded my mind as I estimated how many times I could stab the boy through his face before I'd be forced to stop. Yesterday, I'd managed to solve the missing part of my experiment. The first few years, I was limited to the view screen. A year ago, I conquered the problem of mind movement. Now finally, I can physically bridge the span of time. My mind and body can cross over. I can stand, strong and powerful, over the murderer in his bed. His strength will be no match for mine. If he sees me and screams, it won't matter. Help will be too far away. I write this now as I prepare to make my temporal journey to bring my wife back into the world. I glow with sadistic glee as I imagine how I'll do it, how I'll destroy her murderer. Will I strangle him, as I have so often fantasized? Will I cut his soft throat? Will I decorate his pillow with smeared clumps of the brain that later made the decisions to annihilate the woman I loved? All of it's up for grabs. The most important thing is that the boy must die. He cannot, under any circumstances, grow up. In these last moments, the glee has grown bittersweet. When it's all over, my loved one will be brought back. Her life can resume as if nothing ever happened. She'll never know, though. She'll never learn about the sacrifice I'm making. Her death had been an accident. A terrible, careless one by a young scientist too egocentric and arrogant to use caution. But that accident is about to be reversed. In a few seconds, I'll go back in time to ensure it will never happen. The thought of her reappearing somewhere, safely, when I'm finished, helps make the prospect of killing the child all the better. Even though it means my wife will never know me at all. Even though it means I will blink out of existence. 
It's time to go. Everything I've worked so hard to do is coming to fruition. Should this note remain, let it be the only record of my life after the age of 11. The age I was murdered by my future self. to visit a friend one day. She had recently dropped out of college and wanted to get as far away from her family and their judgement as possible. She decided to move to a small town, practically in the middle of nowhere. This was the kind of town where everyone knows everybody, and everyone knows everything that happens. It had a kind of eerie feel to it, but from what I gathered through the tra- but from what I gathered through travels, most small towns feel that way. I arrived to her house after 13 hours of non-stop travel. Driving into the town was odd. The sign said, welcome, but I didn't feel as though I was. As I passed the sign, I felt a chill run down my spine. Strange. I pulled up to the address my friend had given me, slightly confused as to how worn down the house looked since she told me she fixed it up. It was just past 7pm and it was dark outside. No lights were on inside the house. I pulled the keys out of the ignition and started towards the front door. I rang the bell. Nothing. I waited for a few more minutes, occasionally glancing at the road for any sign of headlights. Nothing. I knocked on the door, rang the bell once more, before deciding to go back and wait in my car. I pulled out my phone to text her as I sat down. She responded, telling me that she was really sorry and that she had stepped out to go to the store, but would be back shortly and that the door was unlocked if I wanted to go in. I did. When I opened the door, a strong, musty scent washed over me. Switching on the lights, the dusty interior of the home was revealed. It didn't seem like anyone tidied up in quite a while. Being a bit of a neat freak, I looked around for something to clean with. After looking for a few minutes, I found what I thought was a storage closet. Maybe there's a duster or a mop or a broom or something. I put my hand in the doorknob and instantly pulled away. It burned. I looked down at my palm and it started to blister. Fire. Panicking. I looked around for an oven mitt or a dish towel so I could open it and the fire hydrant to put out the fire when I got to it. I found a pot holder and the extinguisher under the sink and prepared to open the door. Tying the dish towel around my mouth and nose to protect from the fire, I slowly approached the door, the extinguisher ready, and turned the doorknob. Pulling the door open as quickly as possible and extinguishing the fire, I stood in the doorway, waiting for the smoke to clear. When it did, I was horrified. The room was metal on all four walls. The inside of the door was as well. The floor was linoleum. That's not what scared me. What scared me were the bodies. The some chained to the wall, others strapped to what looked like operating tables. Some lying on the floor, the scene was gruesome. Charred bodies, some of them still had identifiable features. The fire must have been started recently. All of these people were gagged in one way or another. Some of them with rags, ball gags, bits, socks. A few of them naked, some clothed in latex. A few of them cut open, some seemed as though they were still alive. They, they were... I made eye contact with one of the bodies on the floor. Tears were streaming out of their eyes, their mouth still blocked by the rag. I stood there, shaking. I tried to speak, but nothing came out. I tried again. Uh, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm gonna call, call for help. I choked out. They blinked at me and nodded, their face contorting in pain. I pulled out my phone and dialed 911. After the call ended, my friend sent me a text. It read, I'm home, where are you? I looked at my phone, in shock, slowly walked to look out the front window. There's nothing. I sent her a text. What do you mean? I'm in your house. 47 Walnut Road. She called me. I live at 47 Walnut Lane, you dummy. She chuckled. I didn't respond. Luna? Are you okay? I still didn't respond. Hello? She sounded concerned. 
I took a shaky deep breath and looked down at my burnt hand as I saw red and blue lights flashing. I I'm gonna have to call you back, I choked. I don't feel so good. What are you- I hung up the phone and crumpled to the floor, finally letting out a sob. The police barged in the door. Listening to this song while you sleep guarantees a peaceful dream. Sleeping is the easiest, most natural thing in the world. Babies do it all the time without even being taught. It's so easy, people even do it by accident. But not me. I suck at sleeping. Which sometimes feels more like I suck at being human since I'm so freaking tired all the time. It's the same battle every night. Even looking at the clock and knowing I should be in bed is enough to make me feel restless. I've tried keeping on a rigid sleep schedule and burning soporific incenses and popping pills, but nothing seems to make a difference. You'd think my body would just get so tired it would shut off automatically, but it seems like the less I sleep, the more agitated I get thinking how much I need to do, and the harder it is to make love with sweet oblivion. Anyway, a friend of mine named Anu told me her grandfather was this Indian guru who had a remedy for insomnia. My hopes were flying about as high as an iron pigeon, but I figured there wasn't any harm. If I couldn't sleep, at least I could impress the girl by being spiritually open to new ideas and respecting her culture and all that shit. Is it wrong that I pat myself on the back for not being racist just because it seems like everyone else is nowadays? Yeah, just thinking about that is probably racist too. Point is, she gives me this album of Indian music that I'm supposed to listen to in bed. She says it's an instrument called the Ravana Hatha, which is some kind of ancient precursor to the violin. It's made from a resonating gourd covered with goat hide and strings stretched across a bamboo neck. Legend has it these particular songs were written to appease Shiva, the destroyer of worlds in Hindu scripture. It's supposed to be super calming and meditative though, so I just took it home with me to give it a go. The only weird thing is, Right before we parted, Anu also said, Oh, I almost forgot. He said not to try and stop the music before morning, because Shiva will be listening too. In hindsight, is Shiva a babe? It was probably not the most culturally sensitive question, but Anu still smiled. As a whole, I think the interaction was good for our chances of making beautiful, caramel-colored babies down the road. That night I gave the music a go. It was legitimately beautiful, kind of a longing, soulful sound, but not in a sad way. There was just enough lively, melodic lift that I felt more like the serenity of seeds buried deep beneath the snow, just waiting for their chance to bloom. Next came the part where I try to trick my brain into sleep. It feels like I'm playing that, did I put the poison in my drink or yours game, as I alternate between thinking the music will work or not and whether even having expectations will influence the results. Next, surprisingly enough, came a deep and beautiful sleep. In the strangest dream I've ever had in my life, almost more like an out-of-body experience, I was only aware I was sleeping at all because I was looking down at my body while I slept. I could even still hear the music down below, like I was watching myself in a movie. It didn't take long to discover my consciousness was free to move around my house, leaving my sleeping body behind. That part was a lot of fun, and I just sort of drifted around, shifting my focus like I was just imagining different perspectives. But everything was so clear and perfect that it felt exactly like I was actually sleeping. I could even count the number of dishes in my sink and see the minuscule detail in the wood grain floor. I was just about to float over to the living room and see if I could watch TV when I heard the first sound other than the music, it was the rattle of a handle, then the opening of my front door. I startled so badly that I woke up immediately, seemingly teleporting into my bed. Frantic reality checks, the texture of my blanket, my phone beside my bed, the clock read 2.31. Everything seemed normal again. That's why I flinched so bad when I heard the front door slam closed. Panic 
hyperventilate, lie flat and pretend I'm asleep. I really need a better defense plan. I held my breath for a full ten seconds, but I didn't hear any other sounds. Creeping out of my bed, I sped through my apartment in a commando crouch, flipping on every light I passed. It didn't take long before I cleared the last room. All empty. The front door was closed and locked. I couldn't help but count the six dishes in my sink and congratulate my dream memory on its accuracy. Figuring I'd just heard a neighbor's door slam really loud, I turned off all the lights and went back to bed. Seconds later, I was hovering in my room again, watching myself sleep. Except I wasn't the only one in the room. Someone was in the chair beside my bed, also known as the I haven't decided if these clothes are dirty chair. My clothes had been moved onto the floor to make space for it. Naked bone, white skin. Androgynous yet strong features and long strings of prayer beads characterized my visitor, but nothing stood out more than the pair of living green snakes which simultaneously writhed around its throat. He was watching my sleeping body at first, but ponderous and implacable as a flowing glacier, he turned his gaze to meet my perspective. He watched me through heavy, half-closed eyes, nodding his head in time with the music. Seeing his tranquility, I allowed myself to drift closer to get a better look. Approaching him was the most disorienting experience of my life, but his eyes grew at an exponentially larger rate and as though they were gargantuan celestial bodies that I was speeding towards. Soon my room and his body and everything else became insignificant to the cosmic eyes which stretched from horizon to horizon. I had to pull myself back for fear of falling in, at which point everything returned to normal. Almost normal. His necklace of snakes were gone. They'd slithered up my bed, their thick coils sliding effortlessly over my corporeal body's legs. It was enough of a start to wake me up again. I immediately began my reality checks. Blankets, phone, clock. Then I noticed the pile of clothes on the floor, the ones that used to be on the chair. My heart was beating so fast and music was so loud that I couldn't hear myself think. I numbly shut off the music, trying to catch my breath for long enough to figure out if I'd somehow knocked the clothes onto the floor. Something touched my foot under the blanket, so cold and smooth, almost slimy to the touch. A wave of tension ran up my body, overflowing into the thing touching me whose rigid coils loaded like a spring. I couldn't hover anymore, but shit, I could jump. Tangled up in my own sheets, I flopped and lurched through the air like an Olympic slug. I hit the floor hard, but I didn't slow down until I'd wriggled free from the blankets and raced to the light switch by the door. Two long green snakes with black and yellow markings emerged from the blanket on the ground behind me. They recoiled momentarily from the light, but one of them launched back at me, sinking its fangs into my calf. I swatted at it and it immediately let go and backed off again, but it stung like a thousand bee stings, one right on top of the other. I ran from my bedroom and slammed the door shut. A forked tongue darted out beneath, swiftly followed by the head of the serpent which easily slipped through the crack. I stomped and it withdrew, but the second snake was already halfway out, far enough to rear its head back and tense for another strike. I turned and ran. My leg was on fire as I hobbled out of my apartment in my boxers and dashed toward my car. The place it bit me was swelling by the second, and I knew I had to get to a hospital as soon as possible. By the time I got there, I was almost blind. My throat had swollen to the size of a pinhole, and the pressure in my chest was excruciating. I parked right up on the curb and managed to tumble my way out of the car, and I was vaguely aware of some people helping me into a wheelchair after that. When I woke, they told me I was bitten by an Indian pit viper, which confuses the shit out of them because they don't exist anywhere in the Americas. I had an animal service guy sweep my apartment before I got home, but he didn't find anything. He did have this helpful tidbit of reassurances to give me, though. Of course, snakes aren't going to be found when they don't want to be. Shit, I knew a lady who had about a ten-foot boa living in her house left over from the last tenant. It was over a month before she saw an even bigger one. If I don't play the music, then all I can do is lie awake, listening to the approaching slithering and agitated hiss in the darkness. If I do play it, the dream comes again and without fail I'm forced to watch the stranger enter my room and sit down beside my bed, like I wasn't already having enough trouble getting some sleep.